Our second last speaker today, but certainly not least, is Dr. Robert Fair. Rob is an MIT electrical engineer who has also been a Johns Hopkins Medicine professor and is now a uh, computational biology, um, uh, now running a computational biology consulting firm called Integrative Bioinformatics. Uh, Rob came to us sort of out of the blue uh, a couple of years ago and, uh, and just offered everything he had um, sort of out of the goodness of his heart to help out with this terrible disease because he knew someone who was affected. And we've been uh, really, really great to and lucky to benefit from his expertise um, and to hear about his new contributions, which you will in a moment. Well, it's a, a pleasure to really uh, introduce Rob. Um, when he came to us and just said he would volunteer a day a week, um, and then he told us that he was a uh, an ex-engineer from MIT, but now doing biology and physiology, and with a lot of background in physiology. I said, that is exactly the type of person we need. Um, there's probably only a handful in the world that can really do this. Uh, he also told us it was, he started doing all this stuff. Um, uh, he came, came from Johns Hopkins, left Johns Hopkins because he couldn't get grants and came and did a startup here. And uh, that also told me that he was way ahead of his time. And uh, uh, he's been quite incredible about analyzing things. It's such a pleasure to come up with an idea and, and tell Rob, and he says, uh, just like the other engineers, uh, I'll model it. And that tells you, what that means is, I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. <laughs> and that is such a pleasure uh, for somebody. And it doesn't take weeks or months, it, it's very fast. And uh, if you're wrong, you move on. Uh, if you're right, you pursue. And so um, it, it's a very different type of, uh, of science that he's creating. And uh, I, he has an idea that I think is phenomenal. Um, but what we have to, uh, th this is the unfortunate part of how you do science. Uh, we've got to try to prove he's wrong, right? That's how you do science. And, and, and then when you fail to do that, that's when you make a giant step. So we're hoping that we will fail. <laughs> so, so thank you, Rob. Okay, well, I'm the first uh, engineer that Ron didn't call a geek. <laughs> but, uh, but I am one. And I'm on the boundary between biology and um, engineering. I have been my whole career. Even in high school, I knew I wanted to do quantitative biology. But in order to do the quantitative part, you have to train in engineering. So I did electrical engineering. I come from a whole family of engineers. My dad was an engineer, my grandfather was an engineer, my brother is an engineer. It's just in the blood. But for me, biology was where the future was. I wanted to do both. I have the privilege of doing this talk today, but if it was only me and not these other people on the first slide, you would hear only theory. So the fact that there are some experimental outcomes here is all due to the team at uh, Ron Davis's uh, Stanford Genome Technology Center. Uh, and you'll see the names of these people uh, on slides where their particular contributions were critical. So I'm gonna talk about three topics today. First, I'll do a refresher on the IDO metabolic traps. Um, I think this is important because one of my mentors at Hopkins told me that if you have something important to say, you have to tell them three different times. This is the third year of this program. So if you come back next year, you won't hear the introduction because I have already done it. Okay, so now, uh, and then I'm gonna talk about new results uh, on IDO2 mutations and um, a status report on our experimental work. And finally, um, several patients have already said to me today, what we really want to hear is how you're going to get out of the trap if, in fact, the trap is the way MECFS comes about. So I'm going to talk about some ideas about how to do that, get out of the trap. 
So let's first talk about an idea that uh, came to me while studying the genomes of 20 severely ill MECFS patients. When I first uh, came into Ron's office, he had just obtained the sequences of these 20 severely ill patients from a company that does sequencing named Illumina. And so I had the privilege of being among the first to examine these uh, genetic data. And it, since I had read um, the uh, two key books, if you haven't read these, I want you to read them. There's uh, uh, Hillary Johnson's Osler's Web, and there's David Bell's A Guide to Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. So these two books were the, my introduction to the disease. I think they're still excellent, even though they are old books. So you'll probably have to find them and out of print on Amazon, but do it if you haven't already. So the lesson of MECFS outbreaks that I uh, learned thinking about the, the occurrence of these outbreaks was that the very existence of outbreaks tells me, especially since their attack rates, that means the fraction of people exposed to whatever it was who came down with a disease, the attack rates are on the order of three to 26%, depending on the particular outbreak. Some of them are in small organizations like uh, hospitals. Others are whole populations like the population of Iceland. But that told me that any predisposing genetic mutation has to be common, not rare. Because otherwise, you would have this population in the local vicinity that got exposed to whatever the stressor was, the trigger was, and only a few people would have the right genes if they were rare. So the logic of this is that any predisposing, common, any predisposing mutation must be common. So I searched that genomic database that Ron Davis gave me access to, and I was particularly interested in energy metabolism at the time, because everybody thinks when they first encounter this disease, it's fatigue, it's low energy, there should be something wrong with energy metabolism. So I searched for genes involved in energy metabolism. I've spent my life in metabolism, so it's easy to pick those genes out. And I found um, four common common damaging mutations in a molecule called IDO2. And I'm gonna tell you about those next, but I wanna emphasize that this lesson of MECFS outbreaks is perhaps the most important thing I've done so far. It's not the IDO2. IDO2 is one of many possibilities that comes out of this insight that common damaging mutations matter for MECFS. So just as a quick example, there's another common damage mutation in chitinase. This is an enzyme that humans make even though they make no chitin. And um, the evolution of this presumably has to do with fighting off chitin-containing uh, organisms like nematodes and um, yeasts or fungi. fungi. So, uh, there are lots of ways we can go from this insight of common damaging mutations. I'm going in this direction to start with, IDO2, because there are actually four damaging mutations, and they lead to a couple of pathways that are relevant to MECFS. So what is IDO2? IDO2 is an enzyme. It catalyzes the first step in a pathway we call the kynurenine pathway. You see in the middle of that picture, the green molecule, tryptophan, that's an essential amino acid. You can't make it in your body, it comes in in your diet. And then to get into the cell, that's what this picture represents, it has to get in on a transporter, but we'll get to that in a minute. What happens once it's in the cell is converted to a molecule I'll abbreviate as NFK, that's n formyl carnurinine and then to kynurenine itself. And then there's a whole pathway downstream of kynurenine that leads to molecules that are bioactive, um, some neuroactive, some immunoactive, and some in energy metabolism, like NAD. Then the second pathway that goes south in that diagram from tryptophan goes through 5-hydroxytryptophan and ends up at serotonin. In other cells, it goes all the way to melatonin. These are molecules that matter to the symptoms of MECFS. 
These pathways are relevant in the brain, in the gut, and in the immune system, and you'll all recognize that those are parts of human physiology that matter to MECFS. So then, if those four mutations in IDO2, listed in the uh, left-hand column of that chart, um, uh, occur, we know that at least two of them, the first two, the most common ones, are 248W and Y359X. That means a premature stop codon as the X. Those two absolutely destroy the ability of IDO2 to catalyze that reaction. And so now you say, if you're really logical and you're thinking about this carefully, you say, how can it be that that even matters? Because you have IDO1 going exactly the same direction. You see IDO1 down there, the, it catalyzes the reaction from tryptophan to NFK, and then it goes on to kynurenine and everything's fine. So why is it that it could possibly matter that you don't have a working IDO2? The theory suggests it's this way. IDO1 is a special enzyme in the sense that it doesn't act like most other enzymes in the body. One that does act in the normal way is IDO2. So I'm gonna start with it and describe how it works as you change tryptophan concentration. That's on the horizontal axis, tryptophan concentration. In this case, it's the substrate concentration. It's the input to this enzyme. It's how much tryptophan you have to work with if you are IDO2. IDO2 uh, increases, we call this the flux, the IDO flux. That's the number of molecules per minute per cell that are made in, from tryptophan into informal kynurenine or NFK, and then go on to uh, kynurenine. So this is a measure of how well that enzyme works. And of course, as you supply more and more tryptophan, the enzyme makes more and more of those products. That's the red line on the graph, on the left-hand graph. And that's the michaelis menten form. That's the normal form of an enzyme. It means it goes up. And then when all the molecules of IDO2 are making as much uh, kynurenine as they possibly can, it saturates. Every enzyme molecule is doing as much as it can. And so you can't make any more, even though you now raise the tryptophan concentration much higher than it was before. Whereas IDO1, the blue line, doesn't do that. It gets up to a peak, and all of a sudden, it drops off precipitously. This is called substrate inhibition. You raise the substrate concentration, tryptophan, to a higher and higher level, and it fails to make more and more kynurenine. This is a kinetic feature, as I say, it's called substrate inhibition, well known in biochemistry. This is not the only enzyme that does this. I'm aware of 80 enzymes in human biology that do this, and so it's well studied, it's been studied since the very beginning of enzymology. So now, the key difference between IDO1 and IDO2, as you see, is that the IDO2 curve is shifted to the right of the IDO1 curve. IDO1 works at much lower concentrations of tryptophan. IDO2 works at higher concentrations further to the right. So I see IDO2 as acting as a backup for IDO1. When you get to really high concentrations, IDO1 would normally turn itself off if that's all that was there. But IDO2 backs it up because it works fine at high concentrations. Unless, of course, you don't have it. So if you have a broken IDO2, you end up with the right-hand set of curves, the second part of the graph of the slide. And instead of having the total flux in green be something like a michaelis menten curve, you have the pe peaked curve that you see in the right-hand panel of the slide. This is for a situation where the uh, IDO2 enzyme is inhibited 90%. These are all simulations based on uh, work from four or five labs that are listed on the, on the slide that have been doing work on these enzymes since 1967. So this feature of these two enzymes is well understood and well studied by expert enzymologists. Okay, so I think that the reason you get in trouble with a broken IDO2 is that you get trapped on the right-hand side of that peak. You cannot make much uh, flux through the IDO pathway 
And so you don't make kynurenine, you don't make NAD, you don't make um, picolinic acid, you don't make kynurenate, um, a immuno, uh, sorry, a neuroprotective molecule. There are a lot of things you can't make if IDO isn't working. You get stuck on the right-hand side and you are uh, ill as a consequence. So now, how though do you actually get stuck there? That's the next part of the theory. And it says that bistability is the foundation of metabolic traps. Bistability is a concept that comes from engineering or from physics, hard to say, about the same. Uh, bistability is a feature of nonlinear systems, not just metabolic systems, but nonlinear systems in general. Most thinking in biology is linear. And what we're suggesting here is that you need to think about nonlinear systems to understand what's going on in MECFS. So to figure that out, I want to show you a simple diagram on the left side of this slide. And that's where I demonstrate the input of tryptophan into the cell. The little rectangle represents how much tryptophan is in the cell. And the red arrow indicates how much we're using up. In a cell where IDO is the major exit route, and which it would be if you didn't have IDO2, um, and where the transport of tryptophan is the major input, that's all we have to think about. So on the right-hand side of the, of the slide, you see um, a blue line and a red line. The blue line represents the uh, ability of the transporter to bring tryptophan into the cell, and the red line represents, again, the substrate-inhibited curve for IDO1. And there are three places where those lines cross. At those points, yeah, if you're thinking as an engineer or a physicist, at those points, the amount of input is equal to the amount of output. Right? They cross in that graph, and so they have the same um, value on the, on the vertical axis. The fluxes through them are the same. So that means that at that moment, at that point where they cross, you're in a steady state. Steady state means nothing's changing with time. This means that the input equals the output, and so you're not changing. That's a steady state. But I've labeled one of those crossings, one steady state, the physiological steady state. And the one down on the lower right there, that's labeled pathological, is the state where you have low flux through the kynurenine pathway, so you're not making much kynurenine, and you're at a much higher tryptophan concentration. In the middle, there's another crossing, that's called the critical point. And, and uh, uh, so that's the di distinction. That's the point at which you are forced to go back towards the physiological steady state or to move toward, forward towards the pathological one. So obviously, I'm going much too slow because Rick has already shown me a five minute sign. Um, but Let's uh, move on now. This, the paper has been published, and those of you who want to read it can get it from that tiny URL on the slide. Okay, so we've done some things to measure those fluxes. Uh, we haven't succeeded in doing that very well. Uh, we have discovered that B and T cells, we're doing it on PBMCs. You've heard a lot about PBMCs. We've discovered that B and T cells don't make kynurenine. We are working hard on this. Uh, we've discovered that the plasma cytoid dendritic cells, you also heard a little bit about those from uh, Maureen this morning. Those are the ones that are doing the job. They're making kynurenines in, in these cells. And um, that means we need a lot more sensitivity in our mass spec, maybe a hundredfold more, because the, the plasma cytoid dendritic cells make up only 1% of the total cells that we extract from blood. So uh, let's move now to genomics. Uh, one thing that's uh, new and interesting to us is that the, each of those damaging mutations in IDO2 is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. What that means is, from a genetics point of view, is that they are not more common in MECFS than they are in the rest of the population. This is all done based on the work of Pei Dong Shen in Ron Davis's group at Stanford. Uh, he invented and then developed this multiplex PCR method that allowed us to sequence the IDO2 gene in a bunch of individuals. And you see those four green dots 
are both, all of them are inside the P less than 0.05 boundaries for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, so there's no difference between them individually. But I want you to change the way you think about this because each of these is a damaging mutation in one enzyme. So the, I want you to think of them as four different keys to the same locked door. The idea of TRAP hypothesis says that all four mutations predispose to the disease and you only need one of them, it doesn't matter which. So the population genetics question, the one about the genome, should be framed differently from what I framed it for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. What you should do is ask, what's the observed proportion of individuals from, say, the Thousand Genomes Project, the European population, that have no damaging mutations in IDO2? And then go back to your MECFS population and ask the same question. How many people in, with MECFS have no damaging mutations in IDO2? So we did that first for the healthy controls, and we found in the 36 individuals, this is the first row of that uh, two by two contingency table, uh, you see that we found four individuals in the healthy control group that had no damaging mutations. Uh, out of the 36, 32 people had at least one. These are just healthy controls. And then you look in the general world population of European extraction, and you find that it's 54 out of 522. And you see those percentages, 11.1, 10.3, they're about the same. And so in our healthy controls and in the European population, there are about the same percentages. And Fisher's exact test, uh, uh, statistical test, tells us that there's no difference. But if you look in the MECFS population, now the story is quite different. If you look at the column that says no damaging IDO2 mutations and uh, look in the CFS cohort from the Stanford Genome Technology Center, it's only one. One person out of the 70 that we have sequenced has a damaging mutation in IDO2. That's only 1.4% of the group. Whereas, of course, as the same as the last slide, 10.3% of the general population have uh, no damaging mutations in IDO2. So Fisher's exact test again now says this is very significantly different. Those two populations are not the same. And the odds ratio, which is just the ratio of those two ratios, is very significantly less than one. So there's a big difference between MECFS and the general European extraction population. So now, just finally, a couple of slides on what w might we do to get you out of the trap if, in fact, the trap is what causes MECFS. So I like to think of IDO1, which is the source of the trap, as an oxygen sandwich. Okay? Now this is a, a, a description, a, mo a picture of the catalytic pocket of IDO1. That means I'm looking really closely at the enzyme IDO1 and saying when those molecules get together, the oxygen and the tryptophan, they're the two substrates for this reaction, uh, what, how close are they, what's it look like, how might we change it? So the stick models here, you see uh, sticks labeled with uh, na the initial for an amino acid and then a number, those are parts of the IDO1 protein itself. The the space filling models are three. The bottom left one, uh, yep, the bottom left one, it looks like uh, an angled set of uh, carbon balls uh, going from northwest to southeast, um, are uh, the, the heme of this enzyme. So the heme is what coordinates the oxygen that's in the middle, it's indicated by a cyanide, and the Tryptophan is up on top. You see that blue, yeah, I don't think I can actually point to it. Anyway, so that's tryptophan. And you can imagine that at high tryptophan concentrations, the tryptophan's gonna get in here first because it's the most prominent molecule. And if that's true, it's like trying to put the mustard on your sandwich after you've put both slices of bread together. And so you can't get the oxygen or the mustard into the sandwich after you've already put both molecules in. So we're gonna explore, and are exploring, the possibility of increasing the probability that oxygen gets in first by raising the PO2. 
Um, you heard a lot about this from Mike Snyder when he talked about going up in airplanes. That was going the other direction. Pressure goes down and you get lower oxygen in your blood. But if we make the pressure go up, and the, probably several of you have tried hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, PO2 will go up and we hope to increase the probability that you will get oxygen in there first. And then we have to do it long enough. This is not the standard uh, HBO2 therapy. You'd have to do it long enough to consume the extra tryptophan that has built up in your cells. So that's one idea. I had another idea, but I think I'll have to skip it. And uh, so, oh, no, no. <laughs> Okay, over time. <laughs> so this is an evolutionary idea. This is an evolutionary idea. Come, one, probably you don't know this, but the IDO2 is the ancient enzyme. IDO2 has been around forever. Well, okay, forever. You see this coelacanth on the left? This is the gray fish. He's an ancient fish. In fact, up until 1960-something, he was thought to be extinct. And then somebody caught him off the coast of Madagascar. Obviously not extinct, okay? But he only has IDO2. He does not have IDO1. In fact, that's true of many lower vertebrates. They have only IDO2, they have no IDO1. This madaka, this cute little orange fish, is one you'd find in a Japanese water garden. And that fish is a modern fish, has both IDO1 and IDO2. These sequences that you see here are partial amino acid sequences from the two enzymes, IDO1 and IDO2. All the IDO1s are on top, all the IDO2s are on the bottom from different animals, different vertebrates. Madaka has both, but you notice that in that position that's highlighted in color on the right-hand side of the slide, all of the IDO1s have an S, a serine, in that position of that uh, protein. And all of the IDO2s have a T in that position, except one, the lizard. The lizard is obviously the missing link. The lizard invented a high affinity IDO1 enzyme, but it's still the IDO2 enzyme, okay? So why is that important to us? We, we don't care about, well, I like these fish, but you know, it, we don't really care about fish. We wanna, what's this got to do with uh, MECFS? So, um, and in fact, that T is what makes it a low affinity enzyme. And the S is what makes it a high affinity enzyme. That one amino acid is enough to make that its difference. That lizard enzyme, even though it's an IDO2, it's a high affinity enzyme. That means that those curves I showed you are shifted in the correct direction. IDO1 is on the left side of that graph, IDO2 is on the right. If we can shift the IDO1 towards uh, its IDO2 um, mimic, we have a chance of breaking the substrate inhibition. So here's the picture again of the sandwich, and you see that 167, that, so now I really have to point, okay? You see this 167 right here? That's serine 167, okay? Serine 167 is coordinated with the catalytic site, and so it's not too surprising that um, a shift in that amino acid could change the um, function of this protein. And so what we have in mind, and uh, we've already started doing this in the sense that um, Bob St. Ange, who's a scientist in uh, Ron Davis's crew at the Genome Technology Center, has expressed IDO1 in yeast. And so now this yeast can do the first step of the kynurenine pathway. And uh, we have the idea that by doing um, molecule screens, that means exposing these yeast to many, many molecules, that we might shift the position of that serine 167 just by fitting in to that space and uh, bringing the molecule closer to what it would be if there was a threonine in there, the T. And so making the molecule uh, temporarily a low affinity enzyme for tryptophan and suddenly that, mo that molecule would start chewing up tryptophan like mad, do that long enough, then remove and long enough so that you get tryptophan below the critical point and um, 
then the body would cure itself according to this theory. So to summarize then, um, I mentioned again that the lesson of MECFS outbreaks I think is perhaps the most important thing I've done. Uh, second, that there are individual damaging mutations in IDEO2 that are not different on in any individual basis from what you see in the general population. But if you think of them as four keys to the same locked door, then there are significantly fewer such uh, uh, people with no damaging mutations in the MECFS population. Finally, I showed you two, with your permission, two ideas about how we might uh, get out of the trap. Thank you. <laughs>